in this lecture, we'll be looking at optimizing fluid therapy with advanced monitoring. And this lecture aims to show how fluid therapy can be optimized using advanced hemodynamic monitoring. And key topics uh, covered in this module will include the concept of what adequate fluid balance or euvolemia may be, how fluid responsiveness can be determined, including the limitations of the static measures, how advanced monitoring in combination with interventions such as the passive leg raise and fluid challenge can aid clinical decision making, as well as the use of dynamic measures of fluid responsiveness, such as stroke volume variation. And finally, we'll look at how these measures may be utilized clinically. The first concept that will be explored will be one of euvolemia. The challenge of fluid management is simple in principle, but much more complex in day-to-day -day clinical practice. And two concepts are relevant um, to the assessments and management of fluid status in perioperative patients. And they are euvolemia and fluid responsiveness. Euvolemia describes the state of normal body fluid volume that allows adequate filling of the cardiac chambers and makes it possible for the heart to produce a cardiac output that can meet the need of the organism's oxygen demand. In the setting of euvolemia, neither diuresis nor fluid administration is required. However, euvolemia is a dynamic concept, and we are all currently euvolemic in that we have an adequate oxygen delivery uh, that meets our current demands. But if we were to have major surgery, then we may not be so. So it changes depending on demand placed upon the body or the body rather. So euvolemia can be thought of in some terms as adequate oxygen delivery. Fluid responsiveness, on the other hand, uh, describes the ability of the heart to respond to filling volume variations, modifying its stroke volume and consequently the cardiac output and hence oxygen delivery. Essentially, it's the ability to increase your stroke volume to a fluid bolus and hence your position on the starting curve. So the challenge in fluid management is to decide, is that patient or is a patient euvolemic? That is, do they have enough cardiac output and hence oxygen delivery to meet current demands? And if they don't, will it be improved by fluid loading or is another intervention such as the administration of ionotropes required? Now this concept uh, can be visualized with the relationship between fluid volume administered and complication rates in patients having major surgery. If too little fluid is given and the patient is hypovolemic, then they will not have the ability to meet the oxygen delivery that they need, as they are far down on the steep part of the starting curve, and hence they are fluid responsive. In this situation, what we see are patients that are hypoperfused, they are tachycardic, they're at risk of renal injury and failure, and they may also be hypotensive. On the other hand, if we give too much fluid, and we push the patient onto the plateau of the starting curve, and perhaps even beyond, we see the effects of fluid overload in the post-optive period, namely post-op nausea and vomiting, ileus, and pulmonary dysfunction, to name but a few. The challenge is to find the ideal spot uh, where we have given just the correct volume of fluid to minimize post-optive complications, and this is what we define as euvolemia. The translation of this concept into clinical outcomes can be seen in the paper by Thacker. The same U-shaped relationship between fluid therapy and complications is seen with regard to clinical outcomes and healthcare costs in patients having colonic surgery, be it open or laparoscopic. High fluid utilization is associated with increased length of stay, healthcare costs, and the incidence of post-operative ileus, whilst low fluid administration is associated with similar outcomes. This pattern is similarly repeated in patients having rectal surgery and hip and knee arthroplasty. So excess fluid or too little fluid has an adverse impact on patient outcomes. The simpler answer it appears is therefore to give preset volumes to patients undergoing surgery somewhere in this reference range where outcomes are optimized. The problem, however, is that all patients are different. There is no recipe to give the right amount of fluid to achieve euvolemia that will be adequate for all patients in the varying situations that we need to administer fluid. What is needed is a more individualized approach. So in order to reduce or avoid complications, we need to know what the patient's volume status is, whether the oxygen delivery is adequate for the current demand, and if it isn't, how will they respond in terms of delivering fluid, increasing the cardiac output, and hence oxygen delivery, or do we need other interventions such as inotropes?
we have a significant array of information that is available to use, both in the operating room and also in the critical care unit, both from invasive monitoring such as the arterial waveform, CVP or the PA catheter, and also non-invasive information such as heart rates, saturations and urine output, commonly used to make decisions about whether an individual needs volume expansion. Fundamentally, the only reason to give any patient a fluid challenge is to increase their stroke volume and hence their cardiac output. If this does not happen, the fluid administration serves no useful purpose and is likely to be harmful. The most commonly used static parameters uh, to trigger fluid administration in the US and Europe are heart rate, mean arterial pressure, CVP and urine output. However, there are many reasons why these may not be the best parameters to guide, to guide fluid therapy. A patient's heart rate may give us an indication of cardiac output and fluid responsiveness at extremes, but in day-to-day -day practice, it has somewhat limited use. Patients may be on medications that alter or attenuate the heart rate, such as beta blockers. It can be affected by both the inflammatory response and the neuroendocrine response as well. In addition, the sympathetic response can be attenuated with regional anesthetic, and if a patient is tachycardic, it could be due to hypodermic circulation, for example, from sepsis or hypovolemia, or a sympathetic response following surgery. The need for fluids, or rather if the patient will respond to fluids in either of these situations, and this cannot be ascertained to heart rate alone. Blood pressure is used to guide fluid therapy by over three quarters of clinicians. However, the absolute blood pressure does not tell us about a patient's hemodynamic uh, situation. For example, if we take a patient with a mean arterial pressure of 65 millimeters of mercury, they could be euvolemic. In addition, they could also be hypovolemic with a high systemic vascular resistance uh, to compensate for the low mean systemic pressure and stroke volume. Alternatively, they could have a mean arterial pressure of 65 and have sepsis with a high stroke volume, a reduced SVR, and a low filling pressure. And equally, they could have heart failure with the same mean arterial pressure of 65, where the patient has a low stroke volume, which is compensated for by a high SVR and a high mean stomach filling pressure. And given the factors that affect mean arterial pressure, that is cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance, it can be seen that a static measurement of blood pressure does not reliably indicate a fluid status. A urine output is a trigger for fluid administration uh, used by over three quarters of clinicians and a commonly targeted value of half a mil per kilogram per minute is frequently used. Now this figure is calculated uh, from the need to excrete a daily solute load of approximately 600 milliosmoles if the kidney is able to concentrate urine to its maximum of 1200 milliosmoles per kilogram. Now, this figure may be true in normal conditions. However, the perioperative or critically ill patient is not normal. But what they do have is a normal response to stress. In situations of physiological stress, activations of the renin angiotensin system uh, leads to low urine output, and hence low urine output does not always correlate with low blood volume. The natural stress response to surgery is an increase in synthetic tone and the release of antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone, both of which can lower urine output by a combination of water and sodium retention. There is scant data in the literature that supports the notion that low intraoperative urine output is a marker of subsequent renal dysfunction or hypovolemia. So reduced urine output during and after surgery is not abnormal and doesn't represent volume status. And in addition, low perioperative urine output is not synonymous with hypovolemia. This is reinforced in recent work in which patients undergoing major colorectal surgery without risk factors for acute kidney injury were allowed to have a low urine output for two days after surgery and did not receive fluids until it dropped below 0.2 mils per kilogram per hour, some 60% less than the standard group that was targeted at the accepted 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per hour, and at a level that is considered oliguria. Whilst no data on cardiac output is available, targeting a urine output of half a mil per kilogram per hour merely resulted in patients receiving considerably more fluid, with no difference seen in either clinical outcomes or measures of renal injury, and this has also been repeated in other patient groups.
While the urea in the perioptid or postoptid period can be considered a normal physiological response and is not an indication for fluid therapy on its own. The physiological limitations of CVP measurements uh, were discussed in a previous lecture, and these physiological limitations translate into clinical practice. In the data shown, patients here were given a bolus of fluid and CVP changes were assessed and compared with cardiac output measured by thermodilution. If the individual's cardiac output increased by a significant amount, they were deemed as responders. If not, they were deemed as non-responders. There was no significant difference in baseline CVP values between responders and non-responders overall. If CVP increased by greater than 2 mm of mercury, then 60% of people increased their cardiac output. And if CVP was greater than 10 mm of mercury, then no patients responded to fluid therapy. Now, whilst this seems to support the use of CVP measurements, the following really needs to be highlighted. Firstly, although if CVP increased by 2 mm of mercury, 60% of patients responded by increasing cardiac output, that actually means that 40% of people did not. Making dynamic CVP change clinically difficult to translate into a measure of fluid responsiveness. Secondly, some responders have a high CVP and some responders have a low CVP, and this also limits its clinical utility as a static measure of volume status and fluid responsiveness. And if we look at the combined evidence, then the lack of clinical utility of CVP in predicting either fluid load or fluid responsiveness is well summarized in a meta-analysis of some 24 studies. The correlation between CVP and blood volume is extremely poor, as is the correlation between CVP and cardiac index, or the change in CVP and cardiac index as well. The area under the curve for CVP predicting a rise in cardiac output is roughly 0.56, which is considered as a diagnostic fail, and equates to only being slightly better than flipping a coin. Pulmonary artery occlusion pressure and its limitations were also explored in the previous lecture, and the use of PAFC, or pulmonary artery catheters, is declining in favour of minimally invasive technology. And the clinical utility of this will not be explored in this lecture. But it can be seen from the area under the curve, it has roughly the same predictive ability as CVP. There are, however, many robust ways of assessing fluid responsiveness in the subject, some of which require an intervention such as a fluid challenge and a direct assessment of stroke volume change through the use of advanced monitoring. Whilst others, such as the passive leg raise or the use of stroke volume variation, do not require fluid to be administered directly to the patient. There are a number of different ways that we can assess fluid responsiveness, and this includes stroke volume optimization, looking at fluid challenges, mini fluid challenges, and passive leg raise and also looking at stroke volume variation. Just some definitions of stroke volume. Stroke volume itself is the amount of blood pumped by the left ventricle of the heart in a single contraction, and normal value is approximately 60 to 100 mils per beat. We can index this for body surface area, and this is now called stroke volume index, and the normal range for this is between 33 and 47 mils per meter squared per beat. The fundamental reason to give any patient a fluid challenge is to increase their stroke volume, and hence the cardiac output. And therefore, it's essential to measure stroke volume or a robust surrogate measure of the likelihood to increase stroke volume to a fluid bolus. If stroke volume is directly measured, it's relatively simple to assess if a patient is fluid responsive. The principle of fluid optimization is simple, in that by giving uh, fluid, we take the patient up the starting curve measuring the response to each intervention. This is done by using an advanced hemodynamic monitor to measure stroke volume and administering boluses of fluid commonly 250 to 500 mils. Here's an example of a patient. We're on the steep part of the starling curve. We give a fluid bolus and stroke volume goes up by 20%. The stroke volume is repeated or the intervention rather is repeated until the stroke volume changes by less than 10%, so this final bolus here, and the patient is then deemed fluid optimized. That is, they're on the flat part of the starting curve, and any further fluid bolus will not increase their stroke volume. 
Once you have reached this point, we stop giving FLIRD and we have to decide if oxygen delivery is adequate with clinical judgment and if not then we need to augment oxygen delivery with inotropic support. One of the problems with the classical fluid challenge is that some patients will not be fluid responsive. However, repeated fluid challenges in non-responders may result in the risk of fluid overload. One way that has been suggested to address this is the use of smaller volumes or the so-called mini fluid challenge. In the mini fluid challenge, a smaller volume of fluid of approximately 100 mils is given to patients. And in this study, uh, a rise in stroke volume of greater than 6% to 100 mil bolus predicts an increase of stroke volume. It is suggested that volume expansion will be stopped after this 100 mil bolus in approximately three quarters of patients who would not have responded to a 250 mil bolus fluid challenge, avoiding excessive fluid administration in a significant number of individuals. It's also possible to assess fluid responsiveness without giving a fluid bolus. And it can be done in two ways. Firstly, through the use of passive leg raising test. The passive leg raise test, or PLR, is a method to assess preload responsiveness. PLR produces a temporary and reversible increase in preload through an increase in venous return from the lower extremities, essentially trying to mimic a fluid bolus. To perform a passive leg raise, the stroke volume needs to be monitored. The patient is set up in a semi-recundant position and the upper body is lowered to horizontal, while the legs are then raised to 45 degrees. The maximal effect is at 30 to 90 seconds and equates to between 150 and 300 mils of fluid return. If a 10% increase in stroke volume is seen, then the individual will respond to a fluid bolus given intravenously in a similar manner. Not dissimilar to a passive leg raise, it's also possible to assess fluid responsiveness without giving a fluid bolus through the use of dynamic parameters such as stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variation. The use of dynamic parameters allows the assessment of the likelihood of the individual being responsive to increasing the stroke volume to a fluid bolus. Measures of preload responsiveness rely on the change in stroke volume or pulse pressure over a mechanically ventilated respiratory cycle. A positive pressure breath causes an increase in both pleural pressure and transpulmonary pressure. These changes ultimately lead to changes in ventricular preload and afterload, causing a decrease in right ventricular stroke volume and increase in left ventricular stroke volume, such as at the end of inspiration, left ventricular stroke volume is maximized, as is pulse pressure. The decrease in right ventricular stroke volume at the end of inspiration causes a decrease in left ventricular preload and hence stroke volume. So at the end of expiration, stroke volume is at its minimum, as is pulse pressure. The difference between the maximum stroke volume or pulse pressure at the end of inspiration and the minimum at the end of expiration is called stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation. And both are a very good predictor of fluid responsiveness. Essentially, each mechanical breath is behaving like a fluid challenge. Pulse pressure variation is the maximum pulse pressure minus the minimum pulse pressure over a respiratory cycle divided by the mean. Values greater than 14% are associated with being a fluid responser. Stroke volume variation is a very similar concept, being the maximum stroke volume minus the minimum stroke volume over a respiratory cycle, again divided by its mean. Values in this case greater than 12% are associated with being fluid responders. The dynamic parameters can be used to guide fluid administration. And so this is the same styling curve as previously, where the patient was fluid optimized using measurements or using stroke volume measurements and fluid boluses. But this time, we'll use stroke volume variation. However, the principle remains exactly the same. Starting on the steep part of the curve, the patient has a stroke volume of 21%. And as this is greater than the optimum cutoff for 12%, we know they are fluid responsive and therefore we administer a fluid bolus and we see a 20% increase in our stroke volume and SVV comes down to 16%. Now at 16%, they're still above that critical threshold of 12, so they are still a fluid responser. So we repeat the process. This time we see a 10% rise in our stroke volume and SVV comes down to 8%. Now at this point, we now know the patient will not respond to fluid. SVV is low. 
and therefore the administration of excess fluid or extra fluid in this case will not cause a rise in our stroke volume. The patient is no longer fluid responsive. And PPB or PPV rather can be used in a very similar manner. It's important to remember, however, that the dynamic parameters, SVV and PPV, are not measures of preload directly. They simply represent a functional measure and a relative position on a starting curve. Whilst both PPV and SVV provide valuable information, it's important to realize the limitations so they can be used in clinically relevant situations with confidence and safety. For these values to be valid, there must be or take caution in low heart rate to respiratory rate ratios. In arrhythmias, they are inaccurate. Mechanical ventilation with low tidal volume is another area where it can't be used, as is increasing abdominal pressure, an open thorax, and spontaneously breathing. Whilst values of SVV and PP3 are frequently described as optimal cutoff values that have the best combination of sensitivity and specificity, these may not be the best clinical approach to use these parameters effectively. If the sensitivity of the parameter to correctly predict an increase in stroke volume to a fluid bolus is plotted, then above a value of 90%, we can use this cutoff with confidence to find the upper boundary where where we give fluid, we will see a response. Conversely, if specificity is plotted, then above a value of 90%, we can be confident that the subject will not improve their stroke volume to a fluid bolus. However, between these two values, there is a gray zone. Then SVV or PPV are inconclusive in this area and subjects may or may not be fluid responses and cannot be reliably predicted within this area. And so other clinical signs must be used. The PPV, the gray zone for a 15% increase in cardiac output, is between nine and 13%. And clearly this means that above a value of 13%, it can be assumed with relative confidence that the patient is fluid responsive, while below 9%, the patient is not fluid responsive. However, in between these values, uncertainty exists and fluid responsive needs to be assessed in other ways. For example, measuring changes in SV to an intervention through the use of cardiac output. It's important to understand that when using any parameter that defines an individual as being fluid responsive, it's not synonymous with the need to give fluid. That remains a clinical decision based on the relative merits and detriments of doing so. As an example, if a patient uh, having open major abdominal surgery has a stroke volume variation of 15%, then that person will increase their stroke volume to a fluid bolus with relative certainty. However, what is not certain is whether they need that fluid or not. It's essential to assess the situation clinically and frequently with the use of additional information in order to be able to utilize these parameters effectively. For example, if oxygen delivery or flow is adequate, then a fluid bolus will be appropriate in order to increase stroke volume and ultimately oxygen delivery. However, if oxygen delivery is adequate, then such an intervention may be inappropriate. The adequacy of auction delivery is not guaranteed from achieving a preset value and must be assessed through other means of tissue perfusion, such as lactate. In the top example here, the individual is preload responsive, so the SVV is 15%. The stroke volume is 85 mL, so more than adequate with a good map. Base excess and lactate and measures of peripheral perfusion are normal. And therefore, despite being preload or fluid responsive, fluid in this case may be inappropriate. Conversely, in the bottom example here, the patient has the same stroke volume variation, but stroke volume is much lower at 35 mils, cardiac index is low at 1.2 liters per minute per meter squared, and measures of peripheral perfusion are poor, they're suggesting hypoperfusion. Base excess and lactate are raised. And in this situation, so an individual with the same stroke volume variation, fluid may well be appropriate. Alternatively, if an individual is hypotensive, then again a fluid bolus might be appropriate, only if it increased the mean arterial pressure. Otherwise, a vasopressor or an ionotrope may be the more appropriate intervention. Knowing that the subject is fluid responsive does not immediately answer these questions. Both the individuals here have the same stroke volume, stroke volume variation, and mean arterial pressure. 
Both are fluid responsive. However, the individual with the high vessel compliance will increase their stroke volume to a fluid bolus, but it's unlikely to increase mean arterial pressure due to vasoplegia. As the stroke volume is normal, this may be an inappropriate therapy as flow is adequate and pressure will not be improved. The individual with a low vessel compliance will increase stroke volume to a fluid bolus and will probably also increase mean arterial pressure due to the decreased compliance of these vessels. And hence, fluid therapy in this case is the correct treatment. Knowing that the subject is fluid responsive does not immediately answer the questions of how to treat hypertension. However, the use of additional parameters such as DPDT and EADYNE that were discussed in the other lecture can aid decision making. So in summary, static pressure-based measurements do not represent cardiac output, volume stasis, or the need for fluid. Dynamic measurements of fluid responsiveness, that is SVV or PPV, are superior to these static measurements. An SVV or stroke volume can be used to optimize a patient's fluid load. Thank you.